How is everyone doing? Tired? Second to last talk of the conference, third day, yeah? Maybe had some coffee. Well, I'm gonna talk about two really exciting projects called Graphis and Critis, so hopefully you'll perk up a little bit and enjoy the talk. How many of you have heard of Graphis or Critis? Show of hands, okay, cool, cool, sounds good. And then how many of you are familiar with the term software supply chain management? Okay, more hands, perfect, perfect, sounds good. So like about half the room. So today we'll talk about this. The talk will be in English. When I arrived to Sao Paulo, they told me, after I have three Caipirinians, I'll know how to speak Portuguese. So maybe after the conference, if you want to hear this talk in Portuguese, we can arrange that. Um, for now, just in English. So I'm Isolo Greenberg. I'm a senior software engineer working at Google. I've worked on a variety of infrastructure projects, such as search infrastructure, developer tools infrastructure, um, drive infrastructure for Google Drive, and currently I work on cloud infrastructure. And I'm the end lead of the two projects that we'll talk about today. Uh, they're both open source projects, and they're called Graphias and Critis. And I'm also online on Twitter at uh, isolo 22 and if you're wondering, 22 is not my age. <laughs> um, so let's dive into this. So the, today the talk will be in four parts. First, we'll talk about software supply chain management and kind of make sure that we're on the same page about what this means. Then we'll talk about Graphias and Critis and how they fit into the software supply chain. And then uh, next we'll talk about the upcoming release 0.1.0 that we're hoping to release in this quarter and um, in the future of the projects. So let's get started. So first, let's talk about software supply chain management. So as you may guess, Google runs on containers and um, every week de we deploy over two billion containers. And so we have a pressing need to understand what happens to containers, what happens to the code that gets deployed and run. And where is the code that we just wrote? Um, so we need a lot of observability around it. So for software supply chain management, it's very similar to food supply. So just like with food, you pr plant the seeds, you grow them, then you harvest them, you make some food, you deliver it to the dinner table. In software supply chain, uh, you'll write some code, and then you, as a developer, will check in the code, then you build the image, the containers, the binary, you will test and verify it, and often it's automated using CI pipelines. And then you will run some QA testing on it. It could be manual, it could be automated with Canary um, services. And then finally, you will deploy it to production. And this is automated often using continuous delivery pipelines. So now, just like with food, we often wonder where does this good food come from? What country? Is it organic? Is it vegan? Is it gluten-free? All these questions that we might ask about food. Same with software, we'll be asking, okay, what happens to the code from the time it's written and, deploy, uh, and submitted to the code, uh, source code to the time it's deployed? And what about third-party dependencies? We know even less about them. We just rely on them to work. Are there any vulnerabilities inside them? Can we trust the code that we depend on? And uh, what is the overall chain from the time that we added a dependence to the time it gets deployed? And are we compliant with uh, regulations and so on? So we have the need to have central governance process so that it doesn't slow down development, uh, the developer velocity, but also we can have a good look, like extra vision to everything that happens from the time code is written or dependencies added to the time that we get to production. So we use CI CD pipelines to automate a lot of this, um, but also we need observability tools around it. So not just testing and deploying it, but also what got tested, how is that related, who submitted that code, who, uh, why do we believe that uh, this build we can trust, and so on. So uh, Griffiths and Critis come in in the uh, open ecosystem that we're building. So we'll have an engineer that builds and deploys code, and then she sends it to the CI CD pipelines. And so they will do the uh, secure build process, automated tests and scanning for vulnerabilities and analysis, and then deploy, uh, deploying of that code. And so now there's a lot of different vendors that offer good solution for CI CD pipelines. Now, the problem is that we want uh, a centralized knowledge base for this information. So regardless of what vendor you're using, it would be good to have 
open metadata standards so that you can define what it means to have build metadata and a test metadata. And that's where Graph.js project comes in. So it adds a decentralized metadata knowledge base. It will have information about vulnerabilities in your artifacts and build information and so on. So now for deploy checks, we want to make sure that they pass based on our policies. So we would rather write, uh, codify our policies in configs so that we can control and look through the changes as they happen. And so that's where Critis comes in. Critis is an admission controller that uh, when you're deploying to Kubernetes specifically, it will run the policy checks uh, that your cluster admin, ad, admin defines, and then either um, deny the uh, pod to be launched. And so if it finds very severe vulnerabilities in your image or it doesn't trust the image location, and then uh, if everything is good, it will deploy to production. Uh, show of hands, how many of you use Kubernetes uh, to deploy? Okay. Oh, good. Two-thirds of the room. Perfect. So. You're in the right talk because we'll talk a lot about Kubernetes because that's what Critis does, uh, deploy time uh, checks and policies. So now, Critis itself doesn't store vulnerability information. It just does the policy checking. Uh, it already has a lot of logic in it, and so it will talk to the Graphics metadata um, API to actually find out about, given this container, what vulnerabilities are there? What severity does it have? Given this container, where did it come from? Do we trust it? And so on. So that's kind of how Graphics and Critis fit in the overall software supply chain. So now these projects have existed for a while, and they're not just, you know, toy projects. They actually are being used in production. And Google has internal implementations of them that are available on Google Cloud Platform. So Graphics is available as container registry vulnerability scanning, and Chris is available as binary authorization. So they are being used internally, and there are internal implementations of this. So we know that it works in production. So we talked about software supply chain management. So now let's talk more about Crafts and Critis and dig into the details of them. So Critis was developed open source first. Um, the, all the code, all the history of the code is available on GitHub under this link, Crafts Critis. And in the software supply chain, it fits right at the very end during the deploy time. So when you deploy into production, it will verify the policies um, against the policies that you have, and then choose to deploy it or reject the uh, deploy request. So let's walk through the example. Since two-thirds of you are familiar with Kubernetes, so a lot of these concepts will be familiar. If you're not, don't worry, because we'll walk through this, and it will be a pretty high-level overview with some of the details that will be interesting to you to know how Kubernetes works. So imagine we're deploying an e-commerce e website. And so we'll run Kube Control Applied Site YAML, which actually uh, defines our pod with the image that we're deploying. And so overall, it will look like sending a request to Kubernetes. And now Critis is installed inside of your Kubernetes cluster. So we'll install it using the helm install command. And so now it's just running inside of your Kubernetes cluster. And so the request comes in, and uh, the admission request sends the pod spec. Okay? So then it gets taken by the webhook, which runs, actually is implemented by Critis, um, and it will uh, review this request. And it will review it against a set of policies that we define. And imagine that we have image security policy. This kind of policy will basically say, make sure that the, the pod that we are trying to launch, the container in it has had vulnerability checks, and it satisfies the policy where it doesn't have any severe vulnerabilities in it. So now we'll define a policy for prod and for QA, and if you were in Katarina's talk, she talked about namespaces, so it's namespace scoped. And so now uh, we'll, um, we'll go through the image security validator that actually will validate the request through the policy. And then we'll fetch the metadata through, from the Graphics API, which has some sort of database backing it. And we'll talk more about the pluggable backend storage uh, in a few moments for Graphics. And so imagine that. Uh, it finds that there's no, there was an image and a, a pushed, but there was no vulnerability scan done for it. And we want to make sure that the container has actually gone through vulnerability scanning. And so we'll reject this pod, and we will not launch it. Now, some time passes. Vulnerability scanning has had a chance to 
catch up and inspect the container. So then I'll say, okay, well, I found some CV, some vulnerability. This is commonly, uh, this is how we refer to classes of vulnerabilities that we find. There's an open database of the different CVs. CV stands for common vulnerabilities and exposures. And then we just basically sorted by the year it was found and then some number attached to it. So, oh no, we found a vulnerability in our database. So then we can fetch it. Um, Graphics API will fetch it from the database and return it. And then again, we won't launch the pod because we have a vulnerability in it. So then we'll actually inspect this and we'll say, okay, vulnerability analysis is a very hard problem. Um, and often it's better to have false positives than false negatives. So it's better to uh, be more safe than sorry, um, find vulnerability and then say, okay, actually it doesn't apply to me, then not find a serious vulnerability in your container, right? So then we say, okay, actually this vulnerability doesn't apply to me because of like, something that I know about my application. So then we whitelist it. So now, uh, after we whitelist it, we will admit the part. Okay, great. So now we have our application running. Uh, our e-commerce website is up and running. So let's scale that up. So we'll scale it with group control command, and we'll get four replicas. And so the second replica will come up. Okay, good. We're waiting for the third and fourth to be launched. And then what happens is a new vulnerability is found. So vulnerability scanning, whether you pay a vendor or do it yourself, uh, it's constantly updating because the databases are being constantly updated with new vulnerabilities found. And so you're constantly checking against whether it affects your container or not. So now what happens? Does that mean we can't launch the third and fourth replica and we're just stuck? Uh, well, we don't want that, right? Because we just confirmed that this pod is fine to run, so we just want uh, to scale up our application and then figure out what happens without disrupting our e-commerce website. So what happens, uh, what we do here is Critis is very clever about using attestations in this case. So taking a step back, the first time we admitted the pod, um, we'll say, okay, Anytime we admit the image, we're going to record that we admitted this image. So anytime you want to scale up, you can always scale up. Or when the pods get restarted because things happen, um, then it will always get admitted as opposed to being prevented from it as soon as vulnerability scanning is updated. So then basically Critis has an attester inside it that you specify using the um, attestation authorities that you give it, uh, you uh, configure, and then it will write an attestation through the Graphics API, it will store it in the database. So now anytime a new part comes up and we find a vulnerability, we just retrieve the attestation from Graphias and we say, okay, but I did say that this image is admitted, so continue scaling up. That's how we are able to uh, scale up. And then later we'll inspect it. So what happens, like, so now do we not look at new vulnerabilities ever? That would be bad. What if, you know, you discover heart bleed bug, is discover, right, vulnerability. You want to know about it. So we have a background cron job that basically inspects the running of pods periodically. And then it's able to say, okay, for all the running of pods, I'm going to check it against image security policy. And then it adds labels and um, and annotations to mark it as it no longer satisfies the policy even though it's been admitted. So then the cluster admin can react to that. So let's talk a little bit about terminology um, of Critis. So it uses Graphics metadata API as we saw, which uses it to, store, uh, to retrieve vulnerability information and then also store and retrieve attestations for the already admitted images. It also uses custom resource definitions known as CRDs. How many of you are familiar with what they are and have used them? Okay, so great. So they're extensions of Kubernetes open source API and they use to store enforcement policies as Kubernetes objects. They're really cool in how they work and it, it, that's what allows Chris to run seamlessly inside your Kubernetes cluster. And we'll take a look at the definitions of policies in a moment. And then another thing that uh, Critis uses is validating admission webhook, which is basically HTTP callbacks that uh, receive admission requests and then decide should we accept or reject the request uh, to, while enforcing custom admission policies. 
So here's what a uh, generic attestation policy looks like. So we have a CRD, and then we have the kind generic attestation policy where we define it separately, what, uh, what that means. And then we have the name for it so we can distinguish it from all the other policies that we might have because we might have many different types of uh, policies for compliance. And then we have the spec, which is these are the attestation authorities at trust. And so now cluster admin can say, OK, if I verify this image myself, then just trust it any time we launch it. There is, uh, so attestation authorities look like this. So we have, again, a kind attestation authority. And then we give it a name. And then we have some private and public uh, key information. And then don't worry about the node references and implementation detail. But the most important part is we have private key and the public data stored in there. And so we can um, attest. We can show the proof that the image has been admitted by the right person. Now, uh, image security policy, which is what we looked at in the example, will basically have, again, the, the kind image security policy, the name. And then it will have, you know, if you're running Nginx um, image, then just whitelist it. We don't care about the vulnerabilities in there. We just trust it to run correctly. And then maximum severity willing to, to tolerate is medium. So anything above that, we'll just reject it right away. And then we'll let whitelist some of the vulnerabilities saying, we know it doesn't affect us, so it's OK. And we, we can keep running. Great, so to sum up, uh, Critis was developed open source first, and it's built with a community. We have a lot of different industry contributions coming through from all the different partners. Uh, it plugs into our Kubernetes admission controller and works very seamlessly with that, and ensures the vulnerability scanning is completed before it even uh, deploys the image. And it applies consistent deploy policies across Kubernetes clusters and ensures that images are attested and validated before deployment. OK, so we talked about Critis. Now let's talk about Graphias and what that does. So Graphias, again, was also developed open source first. All the commit history is on GitHub if you'd like to take a look. Um, and so where does it fit in with the software supply chain? Well, it represents all of the different steps. So it's specifically meant to be a universal metadata API. So it can store information about the source uh, code and they deploy and who submitted code when and uh, the test results and so on and so on. So every single stage in the software supply chain, it's able to represent. So when we, uh, you heard me say a lot of times artifact metadata API. So let's unpack that a little bit. So artifacts are images, binaries, packages, any of this. We'll just call them as artifacts. Uh, files that are generated as outputs, part of your build process, for instance. Metadata is build, deployment, vulnerability, anything that you care um, to represent and to keep track of in your software supply chain. And then API allows you to store and retrieve metadata about artifacts. So now let's talk a little bit about terminology um, of Graphias and how we represent, uh, think about this. So nodes are high-level descriptions of types of metadata. For instance, we looked at CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exposures. So those will be represented as vulnerability nodes. So for every vulnerability we know that, that we found out through open databases, we will store them as vulnerability nodes. Occurrences are instances of those uh, nodes in a specific artifact. Say you found a, a vulnerability in an image, so you'll store it as an occurrence of that vulnerability. And then we also think about providers and consumers because it allows us to ensure that you can rely on, say, um, third-party providers to do some analysis for you, and then you just read those results. So let's take a closer look. So we have Graphis in the middle of this, right? And then provider would be vulnerability scanning. Say you pay a vendor to do, you know, to look through your containers and tell you what vulnerabilities you have. So then they will store vulnerability notes about given all the vulnerabilities that are known out there. And also, it will look through your container and then tell you what vulnerabilities it found against those images. And so it's, it will store the occurrences for those containers. And now, for instance, Critis would be a consumer in this case. So all it does is it reads vulnerability occurrences for the container, and then it, may, it 
and then it decides what to do with it. It doesn't reason about how bad that vulnerability is. All of that is done by the provider of vulnerability scanning, and it's stored in Graphis API, which can be retrieved by the consumer. So a couple of other terms that are useful um, are resource euros, which are just identifiers for artifacts in occurrences. They're generally unique for a component within your uh, software supply chain. Uh, so for instance, DIP packages or Docker images or generic files will have some sort of resource URL associated with them that you can refer to throughout your system. And then also we have kind-specific schemas, which are uh, strict schemas, uh, very structured, which allows us to, first of all, represent the information across all the different vendors in a uniform way. So it doesn't matter if you're using uh, one uh, continuous integration pipeline vendor and then you switch to another one, you can still represent it. Or if you're using different vendors for CI, CD pipelines and vulnerability scanning, you can represent it all uh, in uh, using Graphias uh, schemas, using Graphias metadata kinds. So for instance, um, for deploying, a node will just have a resource URI inside it to represent what is being deployed. And then the occurrence will have uh, user email, who on the team deployed this, uh, deploy time, what time it got undeployed, and the resource URI that it's attached to. So no matter what uh, delivery system you're using, all of um, any of them can represent it in this way. So this is really meant to be open metadata standard. So now, if you're interested in contributing to Graphis, let's talk a little bit about architecture and how we think about the development of a project going forward. So we have Graphis API in the middle, in the, in the green, and so it provides nodes and occurrences kinds, the schemas for them, and also API methods to store and retrieve them. Then on the bottom below is the database, the storage backend for them. And, uh, those bindings will live in, in the, uh, separate projects. They're not part of the API itself. And so, for instance, we provide Postgres um, backend as an example, but if your team is using MongoDB or MySQL or prefers anything, or internally we use Spanner for the um, internal product. So um, any database you want, Graphis API can be backed by it. And it, if you'd like to contribute it, very happy to hear about it and accept it, and it will leave outside of the Graphis project itself. And then clients are used to store and retrieve uh, notes and occurrences, and they're provided by the Graphis team currently in a separate GitHub project, because again, they're not part of the Graphis API itself. And then the auth uh, system will be provided as part of the core um, Graphis project because we guarantee strong access controls. So to sum up, Graphis is an open artifact metadata standard, and we've had contributions from the industry from various partners. Um, it is used to audit and govern your software supply chain. So without slowing down your development process, you throw all the different metadata you care about, and then you're able to build and look at what happened throughout the whole process. It's a, a knowledge base um, for all your artifact metadata, and uh, we specifically focus on hybrid cloud solutions so that you can use it across on-premises and cloud clusters. And finally, it's an API with pluggable storage backends, so it doesn't matter what your team is most familiar with in terms of storage backends, you can implement uh, the bindings against the API, and it would work well. So it's very universal. If you'd like to uh, ask any questions about Graphis, we have a Google group, Graphis users. If you'd like to contribute, we have a Graphis dev Google group. I call meetings periodically for us to get together as a community, discuss future releases, discuss prioritization. So if you're interested in contributing, please join. And also we have a Twitter account that we monitor actively, Graphis IO, if you have any questions. So we talked about Critis and Graphis and how it fits with the software supply chain. So let's talk about the upcoming release, which I'm very excited about, 0.1.0. So what will we add there? So it's coming very soon. We're hoping to release it in Q2. And there are three goals for it. So first of all, it's enable users, you, to start experimenting with Critis and Graphis on your desktop, on your laptop, to be able to do it on premises so that we can gather more community feedback, and move it towards hybrid cloud solution. So we really want to make sure that you can run Graphis and Critis 
anywhere, regardless of whether it's on-premises or combine it with any of the cloud providers. It's meant to be an open standard for the industry. And once you're able to experiment with it, we would love to gather the feedback from the community because we would like to, uh, the communities help to prioritize all the necessary features so that it continues to be most useful for the industry. The scope is to have standalone credits on Kubernetes with standalone graphics. So to bring up credits inside the Kubernetes cluster with a standalone graphics server, which talks to the Postgres, um, also standalone on your laptop. And then the two user journeys that we kind of think about of what can you do with this is seeing how a container is uh, deployed you, uh, to the Kubernetes cluster, and then also seeing how a container that shouldn't be deployed because it violates some policy is actually blocked from being deployed. And so that way you know that it actually works. So the features that we're gonna add to Graphics are Helm chart to be able to bring it up as part of the Kubernetes um, and publish the image, having a standalone Graphics server with Postgres storage backend, and basic support for Google Client Library. Of course, we know that many of you might be using other languages like Python and Java, and we should definitely talk about how to prioritize it. But so far, the community feedback we've gotten is Go client support is most necessary by the people who voice their preferences. And so, first of all, provide a good experience with that, with the basic client um, library in Go, and then expand it to other languages. And contributions, of course, are very welcome in this field. Now, for credits, we are adding generic attestation policies. So then, as a cluster admin, you can just say, this image is good, just deploy it and trust it, uh, which uh, simplifies some things as you're figuring out what to do for vulnerability scanning. And then also providing a default fallback policy. So what if you don't have any of the policies required, making sure that that's well behaved and well defined. And finally, making credits configurable again, to ensure that hybrid cloud support is feasible and it's easy to use. So if you'd like to uh, learn more and follow along, please, uh, please uh, take a look at the GitHub repositories for Graphics and Critis. Take a look and join the Google groups that we have for Graphics and Critis users. If you're interested in contributing, please join Graphics Dev where we will have more information relevant to the developers. And we are also online on Twitter uh, at Graphics.io. And I will end this talk with questions. So how many of you are seeing a potential for using Graphics and Critis and is necessary in your use case? Okay, great. I'm seeing a few hands. And how many of you are, are interested in contributing to Graphics and or Critis? Okay, a couple of hands, yes. We welcome all your contributions. The goal is to develop this with the industry and make this useful for the whole industry. So the community feedback is very important because you know things that I think are important uh, might not be as uh, of high priority to other teams and companies. And so let's get together and build the most useful thing and build the open standard for this. And uh, this is all for today. Obrigada. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Yes, question. I can repeat it back if you'd like. If you, OK, yes. <laughs> Hello. It's about the structure that you showed to us. Mm -hmm. uh, which component is the vulnerability scanner of this structure? Is it, can, I can use any scanner or is something inside of the, this architecture? Like I can use Nessus or something like that or is something inside of these components? Uh, so uh, yeah, let's see. So just to go back to the uh, actual slide, this one, right? is the question about. Yeah, so uh, for scanning, so we are thinking about providing a scanning framework. We do have vulnerability scanners, the proprietary product for the vulnerability scanning, like on GCP, but we don't have that right now for Graphics. So providing a scanning framework where any vendor can plug in and use that, or if you want to implement your own because you have certain information about the vulnerabilities that might be. So that's in the plans for Graphics. It's not implemented yet, but it's definitely something that we are considering for the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Más preguntas? I speak Spanish, so I apologize if it's like really bad Portuguese. <laughs> well, I sort of speak Spanish. <laughs> um, I think I saw some hands and then people put down their, please raise your hands if you have any questions. Nope, no questions. All right, well, I'll be here around. So if you have any other questions that come to your mind in the next few minutes, please come up and I'll be happy to chat about graphics and credits. And please do contribute your ideas, your suggestions, and please start using it once 0.1.0 is released. Thank you.